Please remain standing for the reading of God's Word. Gospel of John, chapter 10, beginning at verse 22, reading through to verse 42. That's upon page 896, 896 in your pew Bible. John 10, beginning at verse 22. This is God's word. Let us give our diligent attention to it. At that time, the feast of dedication took place at Jerusalem. It was winter, and Jesus was walking in the temple, in the colonnade of Solomon. So the Jews gathered around him and said to him, How long will you keep us in suspense? If you are the Christ... Tell us plainly. Jesus answered them, I told you, and you do not believe. The works that I do in my Father's name bear witness about me, but you do not believe because you are not part of my flock. My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. I give them eternal life, and they will never perish, and no one will snatch them out of my hand. My Father who has given them to me is greater than all, and no one is able to snatch them out of the Father's hand. I and the Father are one. The Jews picked up stones again to stone him. Jesus answered them, I have shown you many good works from the Father. For which of them are you going to stone me? The Jews answered him, it is not for a good work that we are going to stone you, but for blasphemy, because you, being a man, make yourself God. Jesus answered them, Is it not written in your law, I said you are gods? If he called them gods to whom the word of God came, and the scripture cannot be broken, do you say of him whom the Father consecrated and sent into the world, you are blaspheming because I said, I am the Son of God. If I am not doing the works of my Father, then do not believe me. But if I do them, even though you do not believe me, believe the works, that you may know and understand that the Father is in me, and I am in the Father. Again, they sought to arrest him, but he escaped from their hands. He went away again across the Jordan to the place where John had been baptizing at first, and there he remained. And many came to him, and they said, John did no sign, but everything that John said about this man was true, and many believed in him there. Thanks be to God for his word. Let us pray. Gracious God, merciful God. Speak unto us now from your word, and may we hear what your spirit has to say to this church, to each individual, to each family, to us as your body. Set Jesus Christ before us as the Messiah, the Son of God, powerful, able to do all that he has been given. And so work in us, Lord God, faith, love, repentance, whatever is necessary that we might come into true and full fellowship with you. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen. Please be seated. Well, the big question of John's gospel, perhaps all the gospels, but explicitly so in John, is this. Who is Jesus and what has he come to do? Which, interestingly, is the same question the Jews ask of our Lord in this chapter, verse 24 itself, if you are the Christ, tell us plainly. It's about the identification of the one who is known as Jesus of Nazareth. In answer to that question, if you are the Christ, Jesus presents a, a raft of evidence. He speaks of his teaching. He speaks of his works. He speaks of his relationship to the sheep. He also speaks of his relationship to the Father. Uh, coincidentally, he said all this before. This is not new teaching. He is recapping everything that he has taught. And in that sense, John 10 is a very important passage in the whole gospel. Here Jesus comes out perhaps more explicitly and clearly than ever just who he is and what he has come to do. This passage once again 
uh, is, if you like, a, a microcosm of the whole Gospel of John. We're confronted today, this morning, each one of you here today are confronted with the glorious person and work of Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus who is the Christ, Jesus who is the Son of God. What a blessed Savior, a blessed Savior, a powerful Savior, a gracious Savior is this Jesus. In the first instance, we have this question before us, verses 22 to verse 30, is Jesus the Christ? Which then gives way to another question, verse 31 to verse 39, is Jesus the Son of God? And then a third question, if I be, may be permitted from this text, will we receive this Jesus? Not a Jesus of our own imaginations, will we receive the Jesus of the page of Scripture before us today. Uh, is Jesus then the Christ? That's the presenting question of the Jews in verse 24. Now let's just recap several points that we need to deal with. We're coming to an end of the festival cycle in John's Gospel, from chapter 5 to chapter 10, uh, where the work of Christ is displayed against the backdrop of Jewish festivals, the Sabbath, the Feast of Tabernacles, the Passover, and now we read verse 22, it's the Feast of Dedication. And so the work of Christ here is presented to us against the backdrop of what the Feast of Ded Dedication celebrated. But moreover, there's a change in chapter 10 here. The earlier parts of chapter 10 have presented Christ to us really as the suffering servant. The one who has come, verse 18, uh, at his father's command. He has received a charge, a uh, charge from his father. He comes as the one who lays down his life. Uh, yes, as the shepherd, but the shepherd of the flock that will give his life for the flock. Now in verse 22 following, there's a change. The tone of the passage is altogether different. Jesus is the Christ, the Messiah, the King. Uh, verse 31 following, he's the Son of God. This is Jesus in power and in glory. Uh, yes, he's in power and in glory, trust me, when he's the good shepherd, when he lays down his life. But now the tone changes. Here he is, the King of kings, the Lord of lords, and the God of gods, to use the language of the Psalms. And he is presented to us here in chapter 10, verse 22, against the backdrop of the Feast of Dedication. What was that all about? Well, it's not one of the biblical feasts laid down for us in the Jewish law. It's a feast which was started sometime after 164 B.C., it's about probably 200 or so years old. That time when the Maccabean Revolt in the intertestamental period, the Maccabean Revolt under Judas Maccabeus, uh, cleansed the temple, rebelled against the Greeks, and rededicated the temple, which had been desolated by Antiochus Epiphanes when he had scattered pig's bones throughout the temple of God. Desolating, desecrating it. The Jews rebelled, cleansed, re sanctified, rededicated the temple of God. It's against this feast now, an extra biblical feast, that our Lord Jesus Christ is now portrayed. Notice also in verse 22, we read three interesting words it was winter. It was winter. No wasted words in Scripture, and so we find Jesus walking in the temple, but particularly in the colonnade of Solomon. That's right at the outer courts of the temple. Jesus is no longer, as it were, in the inner sanctum of the temple. He's no longer in the center parts of the temple. If you will, he's been pushed to the sides of the temple. It was winter. It was cold. And so were the hearts of the Jews cold towards our Lord Jesus Christ. What does all this mean? One writer makes the very telling comment. He says the Jews were celebrating the Feast of Dedication, which commemorated the purification of the temple. But for the true temple, 
the one to whom the temple pointed, that's Jesus, God tabernacling in their midst, they had no heart. They had no heart for the one to whom the temple pointed, they had no heart. Do you see what's happening in John's gospel? Jesus has been portrayed for us in many different ways. Uh, He's the bread of life. He's the water of life. He's light. He's life. He's the shepherd. He is the door. But brethren, it was the temple that summarized everything about the Jews' relationship to God. Everything that sinful man needed to meet and worship and holy God was summarized in the temple. The very presence of God in the Holy of Holies was there. The priesthood to bring sacrifice to that holy God, reestablishing the relationship between God and man. At the times of prayers to God, everything, we need to understand this, everything that sinful man needed to come before a holy God was symbolized and pictured in the temple itself. Jesus has been putting the jigsaw pieces of his person and work into place throughout the gospel. Now, in an open manner, in an explicit manner, he doesn't speak in parables or riddles that they cannot understand. He states clearly everything that the temple pointed to, everything is found in me. Jesus is the Christ. The Son of God, which makes rather the question of the Jews in verse 24 so terribly tragic. It says, The Jews gathered around him and said to him, How long will you keep us in suspense if you are the Christ? Tell us plainly. Now, this isn't some legitimate, sincere question by the Jews. I'll show you that in a minute. Rather, it's belligerent. It's unbelieving. Matthew Henry makes two important points about this question. He says, first of all, it was the effect of their infidelity and their powerful prejudices that after our Lord Jesus had so fully proved himself to be the Christ, they were still in doubt concerning it. They were still in doubt concerning who he was. But secondly, notice also this. He says this question is an instance of their impudence and presumption that they laid the blame of their doubting on Christ. What do they say to him? Tell us plainly. It's your fault we don't understand. Tell us plainly now. As if his works, his teaching, his very personal righteousness... His healings, the signs, were not sufficient testimony to who he was? Tell us plainly. You know what they're doing? They're setting him up for a fall so that, verse 31, they can stone him. That's all they want is a confession of blasphemy, as they suspect, from his mouth. Our Lord's reply, verse 25, is very telling. He says this to them. Jesus answered, I told you and you do not believe. There we are. I told you, and you do not believe. Listen, brethren, there is nothing lacking in Jesus. There is nothing lacking in his teaching or his works. He says, I told you, and the result, you still do not believe. There's no lack in him. There's a lack of desire to receive what he has to say, but there is no lack in Jesus or his teaching. But he also says, look at my works. The works that I do in my Father's name bear witness about me. What had he done? Well, the first public work, excluding the marriage feast at Cana, because that was private really, but the first public work was what? Cleansing the temple. The temple in which he said, I'm the true temple. Everything you need in this temple, you're going to find in me, in my person, in my work. You want a way back to God from the dark paths of sin? Well, go through the door that is Jesus Christ. That's what he's saying to them. Various healings of an official son, a man who had been an invalid for 38 years, a blind man. He'd fed the 5,000. And John tells us in chapter 20, verse 30, that there are many other signs that Jesus did which are not written in this book. 
Many. If we would record them, we could not fill all the books in the world. Many are the signs. But brethren, you see, this is not enough. It is not enough. It's never enough. Why? Because man suppresses the truth in unrighteousness. Even when the evidence is there before his eyes, even some who were healed did not come to faith. Brethren, a mere external appreciation, listen to this, a mere external appreciation, the seeing, the tasting, the feeling, the healing, does not constitute saving faith. It does not constitute saving faith. We cannot have just an external relationship with Jesus Christ. Oh, it needs to be much more than that, dear friends. It needs to be much, much more than that. It's not about church attendance, church service, playing the piano, preaching sermons, doing whatever you do, being a good person, living a good life. Oh, it's much more than that, dear friends. And our Lord tells us the root cause of this unbelief, and this is an interesting statement by our Lord, the root cause of this unbelief, uh, he says, you do not believe me, verse 26, but you do not believe because you are not part of my flock. Did you hear the way he said that? You do not believe because you are not part of my flock. In other words, the root cause of unbelief is that a divine act of God has not taken place in someone's life. It's the same kind of teaching as he spoke of earlier in John chapter 3. Unless you are born again, you cannot enter the kingdom of heaven. Being born again is a divine act of God, the doctrine of regeneration, the giving of a new heart by the Holy Spirit to man. Notice what Jesus says here. He says, you do not believe. That's the presenting cause. You do not believe. Unbelief refuses to believe. That's just a plain fact. Unbelief refuses to believe. Unbelief is singularly opposed to the claims of Jesus Christ. It's an unwillingness to submit to the claims of Christ, even when evidence is presented before, before us. And so there is a willfulness to unbelief. There is a desirability to remain in unbelief. But why will a man not believe? Why will a woman not believe? What's the ultimate cause? The presenting cause is the human heart. We won't believe. But Jesus says the ultimate cause is because you are not part of my flock. Listen, but you do not believe because you are not part of my flock. Notice Jesus doesn't say because you won't believe, you're not part of my flock. He doesn't say that. There, belief is the cause, causation uh, to becoming part of the flock. But Jesus says, actually, it's the other way around. He doesn't say, because you won't believe, you are not part of my flock. He says this, you do not believe because you are not part of my flock. That is to say, my sheep, verse 27, hear my voice. If you are not a sheep, you cannot hear his voice. You cannot follow his voice. You cannot obey his voice. Our Lord is taking us here into the realms of the eternal counsels of God. He's speaking of a divine will. He's speaking of a divine decree. It's called election or predestination, similar terms. In ultimate terms, brethren, somebody comes to faith because God has eternally elected such a person. In ultimate terms, somebody remains in unbelief because they are not eternally elected by God. And perhaps you think, well, that's jolly unfair. That's not right. We can't believe if I'm not elect. Well, what choice do I have? Perhaps you're not a believer here today. You're not a believer. And you hear this news and you throw up your hands and say, there's my get out clause. I haven't come to faith because God didn't eternally elect me. Well, how do you know God didn't eternally elect you? Were you there when God wrote the book of election? You do not know whether God has eternally elected you. Moreover, it's very clear this. 
this is true. While God elects some to life, he predestinates others to death. But he also ordains the means by which some shall be saved and some will not. What are those means? We can put it this way, brethren. There is no one condemned to hell who didn't want to be there. There is no one condemned to hell whose heart said, I will not be with God. I will not receive his mercy and his grace. I will resist his kingship and lordship in my life. And therefore, I choose hell. The means, brethren, is your own choice. Not that your choice causes it, in a sense, any more than it causes those who are saved to be saved. That's why scripture can speak like this, of hearts of darkness. Our Lord says this, for the Son of Man goes as it has been determined, but woe to the man by whom he is betrayed. The one who betrays does not get a pass because it has been determined that the Son of Man should die. Again, in Acts 2, verse 23, this Jesus delivered up, here's the ultimate cause, according to the definite plan and foreknowledge of God, you crucified and killed by the hands of lawless men. The Jews did it. And they said to Pilate, his blood can be on our head and on the heads of our children. No, brethren. The flock, if you're part of the flock, what happens? My sheep hear my voice. If you're a sheep today, hear the voice of Jesus. And he says this of the flock, these precious characteristics of being part of Christ's flock. My sheep hear my voice and I know them. I know them. That's very precious because there's a lot of suffering in each life here today that's hidden, that doesn't get manifest when we walk in through those doors because we're all too afraid to show it. But Jesus says, I know you. I know your suffering. I know your trials. I know you by name. And I died for you by name. Not only that, he says, and they follow me. Why wouldn't we? <laughs> I mean, really, why wouldn't we follow someone who has done so much for us? And he says, I give them eternal life. They will never perish, and no one will snatch them out of my hand. This is a glorious Savior, friends. A glorious salvation that is ours. We hear the voice of Jesus. He works in our hearts. We follow him, we love him, obey him, and he gives us eternal life. And we will never perish. Though we may die, yet shall we live, as he's going to say, and no one is going to snatch us out of the hand of Christ, our Savior. It doesn't matter whether you think your faith is hanging by a thread. No one will snatch the Christian out of the hand of Jesus Christ. But then he says something of his father's relationship to us also. Verse 29. My father who has given them to me is greater than all. And no one is able to snatch them out of the Father's hand. Oh, glorious truth. He is greater than all. All. It's an absolute. There is none greater than our Father in heaven. And what does Christ say? Interestingly, he says exactly the same thing about the Father as he says about himself. No one is able to snatch them out of my hand no one is able to snatch them out of the Father's hand. That's why he can say, I and the Father are one. This great proclamation, verse 30 of our Lord Jesus Christ, I and the Father are one. Brethren, there's a security, an assurance, a certainty to life in Jesus Christ. A great blessing, a wonderful blessing to having faith. Not that we made the decision. Yes, we did make a decision to believe in Christ. But we understand here that this is salvation top down. Jesus has given his life. 
The Father has loved us. The Spirit applies that work to us in faith. This is what God has done for his people. And nothing can separate us from the love of God. That thread by which your faith is hanging is a chain that cannot be broken. You need to understand that. It cannot be broken. No one will snatch them out of the son's hand. No one will snatch them out of the father's hand. Why? Because Jesus is the Christ. And the Christ and the father are one. I'm running out of time. When, when Jesus says these words, I and the Father are one, you have to understand what a bombshell that would have been for the Jews who were listening. This is an unimaginable thing for a man to say. Why? Because it takes us back, does it not, to Deuteronomy chapter 6 and verse 4, that passage which is known as the Shema, that is to hear in Hebrew. Deuteronomy chapter 6, And verse 4, where we read these words, Hear, Shema, hear, O Israel, Yahweh our God, Yahweh is one. And you shall love Yahweh your God with all your heart. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God the Lord is one. I and the, and the Father, says Jesus, are one. This statement, brethren, is one of the centerpieces of Judaism, also of Christianity. And here is Jesus, you see, affirming his oneness with the Father. And he's speaking fundamentally here of the oneness of will and the oneness of works, What the Father does in relationship to the sheep, so also does Jesus, the Christ, do in the relationship to his sheep. But brethren, you cannot have oneness of will and oneness of work with the Father without being also one of essence. Jesus is saying to the Jews, I and the Father are one. I am the same in substance, equal in power and glory as our Father in heaven. He's saying to them, I am the Christ. You want to know if I'm the Christ? Oh, I'm the Christ. And the Christ is God. And he's one with the Father. Brethren, there's a profound impact here on our salvation. Jesus is teaching us something about himself And he's teaching us about something with our relationship with our Father. In fact, Father, Son, and Spirit. Because our triune God is one. Father, Son, and Spirit. The everlasting, almighty triune God loves his children. Sustains his children preserves his children, feeds his children, cares for his children, protects his children. It is none other than God himself. Psalm 136, give thanks to the Lord, to Yahweh, Jehovah, for he is good, for his steadfast love endures forever. Give thanks to the God of gods for his steadfast love endures forever. Give thanks to the Lord of lords. His steadfast love endures forever. This is the one of whom we speak, who is speaking to you, dear child of God, right now. Remember what God said he would do back in Ezekiel. He said, I myself will come and I will shepherd the flock. I will feed the sheep. I will keep. I will care. I will protect. I will redeem. And here he is, Jesus of Nazareth. We see here the Father's eternal love for the sheep. I say it again, Jesus did not buy the Father's love. He did not purchase it at the cross. He came because of the Father's love. Some of you might not have fathers who you think have loved you very well, or you've not known your father terribly well. 
You have a Father in heaven so wonderfully glorious, pitying, kind, compassionate, blessed, who has sent his own Son to die that you may know his love, that you may have rest. The Son's eternal love is also here exhibited for you, that he came down off his throne of glory, came to argue with fools like these, fools like us, and then to die at our hands to redeem us. In this is love, we know. And the Spirit's eternal love for his people, that he has come to dwell in our hearts. The Spirit of God in us, it's true, because he loves us, conforming us to the image of Jesus Christ. Dear friend, do you feel like the psalmist that your foot has nearly slipped? Do you feel like your foot has nearly slipped? It's a struggle to go on each day. Remember how great Jesus is. He's the King of Kings. Remember how great our triune God. Remember how great Yahweh is. Psalm 121, I lift up my eyes to the hills from whence comes my aid. My help comes from Yahweh who made heaven and earth. He will not let your foot be moved. He who keeps you will not slumber. Behold, he who keeps Israel will neither slumber nor sleep. Yahweh is your keeper. Yahweh is your shade on your right hand. The sun shall not strike you by day, the moon by night. Yahweh will keep you from all evil. He will keep your life. Why? Because it's bound up with his son's life. He can no more cast you off than he can cast his son off. Yahweh will keep your going out and your coming in. Listen to this. From this time forth and forevermore. Not one second of our lives escapes the care of the almighty God. He loves you even more than you love yourself. And that's saying something. This is our God. And if he's not your God here today, if you don't know this Yahweh, if you don't hear him and you don't believe him, you think you're cultured, smart, you're an intellectual, you believe in science, I've got to tell you, you're like the Jews. You're a fool. You're none of the things you think you are. You're a fool, biblically speaking. And this day, you need to hear Jesus Christ speak like you have never heard him before. Some perhaps come here week after week and leave unchanged week after week. I've got news for you. The weeks are running out. The weeks are running out. Now is the time where we flee to Christ in repentance. What does Christ say to you? He says this. My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. I give them eternal life, and they will never perish, and no one will snatch them out of my, my hand. My Father who has given them to me is greater than all, and no one is able to snatch them out of the Father's hand. This is Jesus. He says, I and the Father are one. Let's pray. Forgive us, Lord God, for thinking small thoughts of you <coughs> and of your Son and of your Spirit. Have mercy upon us, Lord God, according to your loving kindness. May your Spirit work in us that we may see the grace, the glory of our Lord and Savior. Kindle within us love, commitment, trust, and devotion that your name may be glorified in our midst. 
We pray this in Christ's name. Amen.